health care reform, and that's the day they started working on these provisions. So this wasn't a bill that was cooked up in a six-month period, or it wasn't written by Barack Obama, which is kind of funny, it's called Obamacare. It was written in 2007, 2008, 2009, and uh, it has a lot of provisions, a lot of things that all thought out, and they kind of all fit together, but to explain them, it sounds crazy. Uh, you know, but it, we'll see a year later, a year from now, if it isn't a bit like a difficult board game that you don't understand until you start playing it, and then you realize that a couple of people understand it, you follow them, next thing you know you're playing Monopoly or one of the other games that isn't really that easy to play. By the way, I never learned backgammon, so. I'm here today to uh, tell you some of the good news about healthcare reform. First, by talking about Medicaid, which is extremely good news in the states where we've expanded Medicaid. Uh, but I do realize that there's 70,000 American Indians in states where they didn't expand that Medicaid. We can't help but believe maybe they'll come along in the future. Uh, Arizona has come along this year, New Mexico, and it, maybe it could happen. Uh, Oklahoma and Texas both said no, no, not until pig supply, but uh, I still think it might happen in those states. Uh, as well. And those are the two states with the, mo the largest number of American Indians in the Medicaid eligible category. If you don't expand Medicaid, that means you have more people than the exchange. All 70,000 of those American Indians will be eligible to be in exchange from 100% like of poverty to 400% for tax subsidies, not the 139 to 400%. So I'll go through Medicaid first and I'll show you a tool that we've developed to both uh, make an estimate for your state, for your advocacy for your state, about why they should expand Medicaid perhaps, and for you to track and plan your outreach and enrollment so that you can maximize the potential uh, of income to your, your uh, programs. Uh, you know, there's a purpose in healthcare reform. It was built in America, so it's kind of strange, but the purpose is to make people healthier. Uh, they say if it had passed four years ago, there'd be 70,000 uh, African Americans alive today. It could, act, it could actually save lives if people had insurance. So there's a, there is a health component to this. It's not because we love health insurance, right? Now, if we do the math for American Indians, you could say 15,000 American Indians would be alive today if we had passed this thing, implemented it five years earlier. So we'll see. Uh, we don't love insurance for the sake of insurance. We love insurance because it pays bills for medical services. Uh, those uh, savings will come to our programs, mainly our contract health programs, but also some of our direct services costs that we'll spend less of our own money when someone pays us for those patients we currently see but now have a payer. And that's Medicaid that we'll start with. I'm going to go through uh, how the calculator works. You can do it on your own. You won't return to this over and over again. You'll do it a couple of times and you'll kind of say, oh, that looks like it makes sense. And uh, yeah, I can see that there is money involved. So the calculator, I have to go back and forth. I've got a screen here that looks exactly the same as that. I'm going to be zooming in and out so that you can see things. And I apologize when I don't get the zoom quite right. So there are two calculators. The first is Medicaid. That's easier. The second looks the same, but it's quite different. And that's the marketplace or exchange calculator. And that's got a few more rules to it. I'll describe that more later. So I have the one, two, three method here of how does the calculator work. The first thing you do is select your state. And does anyone want to give me a state? Alaska. Alaska. And then the second thing you do is I got a scroll bar down there. I'm guessing you can see it. Oh my goodness. We have got an old, uh, a too old version. Now, did I test drive this thing before? No, that's my feeling that I didn't test that. Uh, wait, can we swap out a different PC? In the meantime, let me. I'm going to kill the time to watch out. Uh, no, I can't. So we we need to save myself. Uh, while she's grabbing that. Okay, in the Medicaid, how many, so what is uh, all the health insurance reform about? It's about helping more people insured. So how many American Indians are uninsured? All of them. We didn't them. think about it. 
used to say, I want all American Indians to be uninsured, and I want they all are. service to be fully funded. <laughs> They are. <laughs> I, I wasn't in the insurance business when I started uh, 18 years ago. I was in the get full funding with Indian Health Service, and I didn't want people to be insured. I didn't even like it when people would play back to me what our what insurance rates were. That's fine. I, want, I want all of our travel members to be uninsured. I want them to come to the clinic and know that all the bills are going to be and then no bill collectors in their lives. Uh, but uh, with health insurance reform, our drive is the view that there's a trust responsibility that uh, we will, uh, we will, uh, uh, argue for a fully funded IHS, but we adapt. Over the years, uh, I've worked on the Scholar Tribe, where I'm the health director. Uh, the tribe uh, has not been in priority one since 2008. It's been 13 years, and I've been in priority one. Uh, we cover orthodontia, we cover chiropractic, we cover massage therapy, uh, we cover uh, one other thing like that, acupuncture. Uh, so we have a comprehensive health care package because we adapted and we did maximize our Medicaid revenues, public insurance. We've got our Medicaid up to a couple million dollars a year. We not only sign people up, but we make sure they get all their screening. We find providers and we pay them uh, any costs that aren't covered by Medicaid. And uh, we have a robust Medicaid program that averages about $4,500 per person in medical expenditures. Uh, for our Medicaid patients, 355 Medicaid patients in a tribe of 1,500. Uh, not good news if they're in low lower income, there's fewer and fewer everywhere as we are in the development. We've also bought insurance for many years. Washington's one of the states that has uh, had a state uh, subsidized insurance program. So since 1998, we've purchased insurance. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. The marketplace is someone purchasing insurance. And what we believe, we're not gonna walk away from the trust responsibility ourselves, we're not gonna tell tribal members they have to buy insurance, we have to buy insurance. And we did that to the state plan since 1996, and at one time it was as high as 135 tribal members had their, care, their insurance purchased by us. Uh, another thing we did was, if we had a really high cost patient, I would slip, we would not be, I did, I've done very little for me, I would say I could explain what they did. Uh, but I, I encourage it. We, if someone's really, really got high medical bills every year, we buy them insurance almost no matter what it costs. We buy them insurance. So I have 11 people that, that generate more than a million dollars worth of health care costs every year, and we pay about $66,000 for 11 people. That's pretty high for an individual. It's only 11 lives covered. That $66,000 saves us almost a million. So we're used to that. So that idea of being used to buying insurance is key because not all tribes are used to buying insurance. What do you use to purchase? What dollars are you using? We use contract health. We, we, we believe in uh, Medicaid. We believe you use third party collections from Medicaid as well. I hope IHS will come to that belief too and allow their direct service programs to use those third party Medicaid. But I, I'm not saying that as any official policy. But we don't need to go into that. We, uh, we use our CHS program. Oh, so the reason I ask that is that in the Affordable Care Act, there's some language in there, not the Affordable Care Act, in the Health Care Improvement Act, that talks about allowing tribes to be able to use dollars to purchase health benefits for beneficiaries. Yeah. But I pressed, I was in a conference call with Indian Health Services and a bunch of others asking what's the status of that. But technically there's language in there that allows tribes to do that. Well, it's unbelievable that, again, three years into this, I just have never been answer to that. We pointed that out like day one, that can we do this or not? We knew the tribes, the 638 programs could do it. We knew that. But I, it did seem like I just could do it too. And, but it's still an unanswered question. It's almost unbelievable to me. I visited the Fresh Service Tribe, went through this uh, you know, discussion, of course, you know, what we call them, but it's a call bill, you know, they don't, they don't like insurance. They have never bought insurance. Uh, do they want to push the issue of uh, using their uh, third-party revenue? That's maybe some people say you can't do that. I think you can. Or do they want to contract a CHS program? I think they're thinking about contracting the CHS program, if not this year, next year. But you can tell by the uncertainties that a lot of times are going to let somebody else go first. We're right behind you, and if it works, maybe we'll do this next year. But one of those things would be direct service tribes, and they see uh, not the Medicaid expansion, but the marketplace sponsorship idea, 
works, then they will probably contract their CHS programs. But Jim, I know you've heard, we've heard the IHS director and other Jeff Roth suffer through that discussion of, well, we're not sure, you know, we can use IHS dollars or CHS dollars to buy insurance. There's no 1099 you would generate, so that's the problem. You don't want your private members to be buying insurance, you don't want them getting a $12,000 1099 with that big taxes on it. We can do them all. Six or eight programs. I just need to push that. Well, you know, some of the out of the box things that we've been looking at was why not use the shed money to purchase stop loss similar to what tribes do? They'll never run out, unlike what check happens to shed. Why can't tribes contract chef and utilize that to purchase stop loss? The other thing we're trying to we've been figuring out how to explore is well, well, and a lot of the case for intuition. Tribes and IHS are left to negotiate with physicians. Why can't they go out and rent a network? Like tribes do with their self-insured plans, why can't you rent a network and take advantage of the, the you know, I'll use Blue Cross Blue Shield network, um, you know, the network rates. Yeah. Well, and can you say how many direct service projects? Yeah, how many direct service, I, I heard, so it's, uh, I heard Montana, <laughs> how many direct service tribes do we have? I just want to note on that, because this really is an important policy discussion. I think in some ways, IHS is avoiding the discussion because the direct service tribes aren't bringing it forward. But really, it does call the question about why should you absorb a $3,000 to $5,000 case in your CHS program when you can march the person down to the insurance exchange, you got a monthly enrollment option. No cost sharing exemptions, and sign them up for insurance. So, and then really, to go further than that, it's going to be tribes like yours, EDS, you know, that sponsor premiums that are going to alleviate the need to even have a CHEP program. So when is IHS going to be in the policy discussion about how we're going to redo this CHEP concept and fix that part of it? Because in a way, those tribes that sponsor premiums are allowing more additional money or additional money to be included in CHEP for access to the direct service tribes that was put there in place that would benefit all tribes. So that policy discussion is going to come about at some point. Is Jack catastrophic? Yes. Would you, excuse me, would you roll that? Thank you. Please, guys. <laughs> Hello. Um, <clears throat> before I say anything, I have to express myself in my own language to our, gra our, our people. Tokaya Tungashla Wopla Waku. Let me at your matomi a heavy air. Chunk bell be matua. Relatives, before I say anything, I want to thank the Creator first. My Lakota name is Bear Woman. My English name is Joanne Spotted Bear. I come from Wounded Knee. I am a descendant of the Little Bighorn, the Wounded Knee Massacre, World War I, World War II. 1973, my father was a cop. Today, I am a law advocate for Dorino Sparks Indian Colony, the Fallon Pai Shoshone Tribe, and I am assistant judge for Rudy James of Winnemucca, and I am the Tetuan Treaty Second World Representative. My question here is, first, to my people, is how many of you heard of the, 19, or the 1783 Paris Treaty? That treaty, there's only 13 states on the East Coast, and the East Coast being 13, those 13 states are still on lease. There's a thing called the Custa Q Trust. How many of you know about that Custa Q Trust? That Custa Q Trust benefits birth certificates, social security cards, U numbers, bank account numbers, all that. Our, our, our Indian people should be taken care of on the grassroots. We shouldn't be paying taxes or even medical bills like this. 
And quite honestly, I always get hurt because I always wind up telling the truth. Pine Ridge, there was $2.64 billion of embezzlement. The XL pipeline documents, government documents being misused, and um, voting fraud. Last year, I ran for tribal president in Pine Ridge. And here in Nevada, when I started five years ago, there was 21 tribes in less than one year dropped down to 19. One of my questions were, who's telling our Indians when we're Indians and when we're not? And when we have to pay taxes and when we don't? We have 300 million Indians who died for these taxes that they're talking about. I wanted to wear my buckskin dress and really get dressed up today and represent one knee, but I wanted to see what was being said first. Our, our eagle feathers, our way of life, our songs like that, them good things. I love our people, I love all of you. So last two days I've been, I've been sending documents to the United Nations, to this guy named Sir Kurt something. Two years ago, 2011, I, I asked Larry Echohawk to help the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation genocide and poverty of the $2.64 billion and the people paying rent on condemned homes with lice, mice, and cockroaches. And none of you guys helped. And then you come here to Reno and you charge $450 and tell our people they have to pay medical costs with a budget of $1,350,000 to rent this for five days. That really hurt me. I'm sorry to bust your bubble and really make you feel bad, but that's how we've been filling the grassroots. Our grandmothers and grandfathers, they talk about these things over here that's going on. And something needs to be changed, but it ain't our people. That the money you're talking about right there, and that insurance, that QSTA, Q Trust, they can, they can, you can use that money. This is called double dipping. And those laws that are the United States is using right now, Americo Vespucci died in 1507. He died of syphilis. And the treaties, they started in 1059 before Christ. The actual treaties were the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, it says, thou shalt not steal. It's written in your constitution. Your constitution, US, the United States Constitution, Article 6, Clause 2 states, treaties are supreme law of the land. We are a treaty tribe. As for California, you have 18 unratified treaties. You're still technically a territory. But they don't tell you that. But they will tell you they want you to pay prices to give to them so they could be more richer, more better than, than the rest of us are. Really bothers me, really hurts me, and I'm sorry to have said what I said, but I'm not sorry enough because I keep talking. <laughs> so I apologize like that to my, to our people. Please forgive me. Chi lebiacha, matomia hemie, chunkbe opio matua. My people, they died in the Wounded Knee massacre, and today they want to sell Wounded Knee. Why? Because one person came and we give them an opportunity and they took advantage of it and then now they want to get rid of my loved ones. My people didn't do nothing to you guys. They didn't do nothing at all but give you a place to live. So I want to say thank you for that very much. Let me